What is Oriental Orthodoxy? I'm Michael with Reason and Theology. Today I'm joined by guest Subdeacon Daniel Kakish, a Syriac Orthodox Christian, and also Craig Trulia, an Eastern Orthodox Christian. So, uh, Subdeacon, thank you for uh, coming on to this show. I'm glad to have thank you. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Yes. Um, so, would you mind maybe just explaining to any of the viewers what exactly is Oriental Orthodoxy, and then we might get into maybe some of the differences between that and Eastern Orthodoxy. Sure. So, we are a communion of uh, six churches: uh, Alexandria, Antioch, Armenia, Ethiopia, er Eritrea, and India. Uh, we believe that we are the one holy Catholic and Apostolic Church, uh, continuing. Uh, the rightful lines of those patriarchs um, going from obviously you know uh, what happened between the schisms between our churches that we continued preserving that one apostolic faith until okay. the present day okay yeah. and how did you end up becoming um oriental orthodox so uh initially i i converted from protestantism in 2013 and uh, I didn't really at that time recognize a difference between Eastern and Oriental Orthodoxy. And then over time, and it just so happened that the Syriac Orthodox Church was closer to me geographically speaking. And then over time, I realized the differences. And then uh, I studied Chalcedon um, and the controversy that happened uh, in the 5th century and the 6th century as well. And so that whole hundred years or so, um, and then I decided that this is mm -hmm. this uh, this is the right side of that. Right. Now, yeah. what would you say kind of convinced you to the um, to that side of um, the debate back in Chalcedon? I, and I don't necessarily want to call it the the Monophysite side because you you would probably take issue with that terminology. So correct me if uh, you prefer different terminology, but what made you side with that rather than Chalcedonian Christianity? Sure, so um, we we go by Miaphysite, and uh, the reason why is because, like St. Severus' challenge to the Chalcedonians was, show me a father who said, in two natures. We believe of two natures or from two natures, but in two natures, we believe, is a definition from Pope Leo. And uh, then this is not found in our tradition before Chalcedon or before Pope Leo. So then if we were to be genuine to the way of terming Christology according to our fathers, then we would not accept this formula. Um, at the time, as you know, it, a lot of the Nestorian controversy was happening. So especially in our area, in our geographical region. And it was very close and it was very dangerous to that. Uh, and we, like, con we were very uh, cautious of this and careful. So we decided to um, stay with the formula that we knew. And it was the safest one for us in preventing uh, mis or misunderstanding or confusion into what was the Nestorian heresy. And then we later agreed, uh, especially after the, the next ecumenical council in the Chalcedonian church, Constantinople II, then we were saying the same Christology. We, uh, that council interprets Chalcedon in a way acceptable to us, Christologically. So you're saying you would accept the Fifth Ecumenical Council as clarifying what the Fourth Council meant? Did I understand that correctly? Indeed, yes. That The Christology of the Fifth Ecumenical Council is 100% acceptable to the Oriental Orthodox. Okay, so you would essentially agree with those that would say, really, there isn't a schism, a theological schism here. It was primarily a misunderstanding of terminology. Is that accurate? Yeah, and we see that with the agreements we have with the Vatican today. Uh, the Coptic Pope uh, has an agreement with um, the Pope of Rome, and the Patriarch of Antioch has an agreement with the Pope of Rome, and multiple Popes of Alexandria and Patriarchs of Antioch have reaffirmed this Christological agreement. Uh, Craig, would you agree with that, that this was, you know, essentially a misunderstanding when it comes to terminology, or do you think that there still is a theological schism between the Eastern Orthodox and the Oriental Orthodox? I personally am not too well versed with the theological differences, not from want of reading Chalcedon and, 
and some of these fathers, but from want of <laughs> mental capacity to know what they were talking about. Right. Um, I do think that in recent years, I think most recently in the early 90s, that the Eastern Orthodox and Ori Oriental Orthodox tried having one of these kumbaya meetings and tried to say, oh, we got all this common ground. And and yet there it, it still eludes both our communions, which to me betrays there are still differences. So while I know with Roman Catholics and Oriental Orthodox, um, you know, they'll observe, they believe they both have valid sacraments and things to that effect. Um, and I would think there's some in the Eastern Orthodox communion that would affirm the same thing. The Ortho Eastern Orthodox are not universal with that. I'd say the, the larger issue really is that being that the church is not going to be propagating wrong doctrine would be, you know, who went into schism, who really is the church, because that would really decide those things and decide what emphasis we put on what fathers. Because I think we all agree that terms we're arguing about probably would have not even been all that recognizable a hundred years before Chalcedon because it was it really wasn't until Ap Apollinarianism that these issues really started to gain, become debatable. Okay um, and so Deacon I, I have a, another question for you um, outside of me office I guess you would call it me office or <laughs> not exactly sure how to pronounce it I, I've been more familiar with the term an office I how, how exactly did you say it me office or me yeah. okay me office that's a mouthful but <laughs> I, I have a question outside of that because I was watching a video eh, probably a year ago about the differences between Eastern Orthodoxy and Oriental Orthodoxy and one of the things that came up was theosis at least this one particular Oriental Orthodox was proposing that there is a distinction between um, what the Oriental Orthodox believe about divinization and what Eastern Orthodox believe about it. Would you agree that there's a difference there or would you say that, you know, we essentially believe the same thing? So I am also not too well versed on this specific topic, but from my understanding and reading St. Ephraim, uh he's he talks about theosis in a way that would um be this is our theology so uh if the person who you spoke to i if i had to guess i would say the reason why he's saying that is because pope shenouda blessed memory uh he wrote a book against it and the, and obviously as you know we don't have papal infallibility or something like that mm -hmm. so Easy, it's easily said that he could have been mistaken or he misunderstood what he was talking about. Um, and and because of that, it could be that that person has said that to you. But um, from reading Cyril of Alexandria or our other great saints, it's very clear to me that they believe in theosis. So if there is a different way of understanding it between us and the Eastern Orthodox, I'm not aware of that. But Indeed, it is part of our theology. Yeah, fair enough. Um, Craig, would you would you say that you would agree with that? I would say I would I would venture to guess the real point of difference would be the energy essence distinctions, because Gregory Palamas would have just not been part of the radar of you know Oriental Orthodoxy at that point. Um, so I think we all agree on what Saint Irenaeus and uh, Saint Athanasius and the, you know the prototypical um, theosis verses. But um, how exactly it works, I'm sorry, my cat <laughs> told her to say, uh, how exactly that works, um, I think the terminology would be different. And I would say with charity that in some, uh, in some ways, the Oriental Orthodox uh, twist on it may be more patristic because what the Eastern Orthodox belief has now been framed within the parameters and terminology of Gregory Palamas. So, Craig, why did you go with Eastern Orthodoxy instead of Oriental Orthodoxy? Because I know at one point you were Protestant and you were researching these issues and you decided to go that route. What was kind of the tipping point for you? You know, it's interesting that you asked that because it was something I actually gave some thought. Um, it seemed clear to me that Roman Catholicism was not the church simply because you did not see their ecclesiology adhered to by the fathers. Um, by the vast preponderance of them. So closest church to me was actually a um, 
Mif is a church. Um, Indians. Um, I can't pronounce it. S R A Sarakwa or Alakara. <laughs> <laughs> whatever it is. Right. But there's actually a pretty close church of Indians nearby. And so I actually did not know so much about, well, are they Eastern Orthodox or the Oriental Orthodox? I, I didn't know. And I found out that sadly they're Oriental Orthodox. So they already going to mean what their food would be like and stuff like that, because I like Indian food. Um, but that being said, um, why then not the Oriental Orthodox and the Eastern Orthodox? And um for one, I think the issue was the, and this I would admit would be just more a weakness where you go, okay, well, the Chalcedonian definition, that's what I'm used to. So that seems right. Again, that's not a very good argument, but these are the sort of things when you're considering conversion that may weigh heavier than they would upon later reflection. Um, the other thing upon reflection, though, it seemed pretty clear to me that the um, the Oriental Orthodox were schismatic, and that was the more persuasive factor because that was the real that was the real thing that encouraged me to convert. So that's why, like I said before, um, the church is going to teach right doctrine. The question then would be, who is the church? You can't say, well, the one who has better doctrine because we already have different opinions on that. Yeah, and, and so, Deacon, how would you answer that and say that the Oriental Orthodox are identifiable as the one true church over against the Eastern Orthodox? How would you say that one group is in schism from the other? Yeah, and with with all love for the Eastern Orthodox, and my whole dad's side of the family is Eastern Orthodox, uh, the, the libellus of Pope Hormistus, um was really the breaking point for why we just couldn't to reunite because like uh, Justinian had given us these conditions to accept and that was the only thing that we just couldn't couldn't uh, reconcile it was anathematizing every patriarch including the Chalcedonian ones who simply just were not in communion with the Pope during the Acacian schism from 480 or I think until 518. So even if you did accept Chalcedon, you were still anathema for not being in communion with the Bishop of Rome. And so the Eastern Chalcedonians accepted this, therefore condemning themselves from 484 to 518 because they were not in communion with the Bishop of Rome. To me, that sounds very Roman Catholic. Um, and when, as an Oriental Orthodox, if I am saying, we are right regardless of if we're in communion with the Bishop of Rome or not because of this Christology. Even if we ended up saying it's the same Christology, we can't say that we are anathema simply for not being in communion with him. Okay. And, you know, I'm sure you would also take issue with the part of the formula that does seem to promote a form, at least, of papal primacy. Mm -hmm. um, so, Craig, what would you say to that? Because essentially it sounds like the subdeacon is saying that Eastern Orthodoxy is too popish. So <laughs> how, how would you respond to that? I would say, though, that in in my my view, and again, this is wouldn't be my wheelhouse of ancient history for sure, would be that sound that seems to be somewhat of an anarchism because that would have preceded the Fifth Council. Um, that, that would have preceded the obvious overtures of Justinian to bring the Oriental Orthodox back to the fold. In fact, they really weren't out of the fold until, you know, as far as I know, Jacob Baradai, however you pronounce his name, pretty much ordained a whole parallel church. So what we had before then was the Bishop Alexander was in communion, who's out of communion, who's in communion, out of communion. We had Ant with Antioch, in communion, out of communion, in communion, out of communion. And... It's in retrospect where you look like, look, the schism started at the at Chalcedon, but it really wasn't true. I mean, East, you know, the Constantinople of Rome went in and out of communion a ton of times. Just simply uh, temporary excommunications did not mean that Christians themselves really felt that charity is broken between them. And if you were visiting those lands, you wouldn't commune there, things to that effect. Um, so I think really the the real schism, just like I would say, short answer crusades between Roman Catholic Catholicism and Eastern Orthodoxy, is the short answer is there was a parallel church set up by Jacob Aradai, and that parallel church never returned to the fold, no matter how many overtures 
uh, and quite frankly, selling out the Eastern Orthodox were trying to do, um, it actually created schisms in the West, how far they moved towards the Oriental position to bring them back to the fold. And I think the death knell ultimately was Islam, where then no longer could you, could you exert authority and, and get in there. And quite frankly, the caliphate would, you know, just like in a sense, there was an interest in the Turks keeping the Eastern Orthodox from joining communion with Rome for political reasons. It would have been the same for the caliphate. Um, so I, I think if, I don't know, uh, Iraq fell in Muhammad's head and never existed, um, we might not even be having this conversation today. We might have been able to re-enter communion, but sadly, that those temporary breaks in that parallel church, they were never able to come back once the, the Persian ascendancy right before they collapsed and the caliphate took over. That's, that's my best understanding of the history. So, Dickon, I want to give you the opportunity to maybe provide some thoughts about that before I move maybe to the next question. Did you have a follow-up to that? Sure. Uh, so we see the the break, the real practical break, at when Severus was deposed at 518. And uh, we continue to recognize him as the rightful patriarch of Antioch, whereas Paul the Jew became the Chalcedonian one. Um, so... In this, we didn't, all the overtures that you said that Justinian had made for us, we, we had no problem with accepting, except the one that had us accepting the libellus of Hormistus. Because if we did that, we are anathematizing our, our own succession for a period of five, 484 to 518. So all of this time who for us became saints in our diptychs, is now an asset. And this is something we couldn't do if the Eastern Orthodox were able to do. Okay, <clears throat> fair enough. Uh, let me ask you this. What I've noticed, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the Ethiopian Orthodox are in communion with your uh, your church, the Syriac Orthodox. Is that correct? Definitely. Yeah. yeah, what I've noticed about them um, in looking into canonical studies is that they appear to have a larger canon um, than the rest. They They seem to hold to at least 81 books in their canon with some additions not only to the Old Testament but also to the New. Would you agree with um, the Ethiopian Orthodox canon? Would you say that your canon of scripture is different than the Eastern Orthodox? Or in, and if it's not, why is it different than the Ethiopian canon? Uh, it's a great question. So in Oriental Orthodoxy, um, the, the different rites that we have, each rite has its own canon for the, the Bible. We don't have the same canons as each other. And that's okay for us because I can believe in, like, let's say, Revelation, for example, which is officially not in the Syriac canon, it, meaning the lectionary and uh, the prayers and all of these things. Um, I can believe that it's inspired mm -hmm. because it's in the Coptic church or it's in the Ethiopian church or whatever, and not in my church. And it's not canonical. But okay. It's so you're making a distinction between what is canonical liturgically and what is inspired by God, which which is a distinction that you you know often encounter in the early church. So fair enough, but um, would you say that there are additional books in their 81 um, canon? Would you say that all of those books are inspired, even though they might not necessarily be canonical liturgically in your church? I, I don't know all of the books that they have, but if they believe that all of their books are inspired, I have no problem with that because I've never studied this. I want to say they accept First Clement just from one of the lists that I've seen, which, you know, when, when you read First Clement, it really does not feel any different than the New Testament. I mean, it really does have that same feeling to it. Um, but I know that's pretty subjective, you know. Um, and I also recognize in the early church, there were some who did maintain that it was part of the canon. Um, so they might be able to make an argument there. But I do, I do find it interesting that they have a first Clement and a few other books, if I'm not mistaken, uh, but the rest don't. Um, Craig, what do you think about that with them accepting some larger books in their canon? Do you think that's legitimate or? I don't think that's any different than what we see in Eastern Orthodoxy. Um, I know that the Georgians accept uh, Fourth Maccabees, for example, and uh, and depending what Eastern Orthodox um, canon we speak of, whether or not we accept even Third Maccabees or not, 
Um, so it's it speaks to Oriental Orthodoxy being really of the same mindset that Eastern Orthodoxy is. That you know, um, we understand what the scriptures are, and we have not had anything cataclysmic that has forced us to really discern. Okay, well, is Third Maccabees really scripture, or is it not? Or is First Esther is really scripture, or, or is it not? Because you know, none of our doctrines are hinging upon it. They're not really using liturgical readings. Um, and by everyone's agreement, they're profitable for reading and there's nothing wrong in them. So I think, again, it's the same as the ancient church. So I see no problem whatsoever. Okay. Um, so Digger, what would you say are the necessary steps for reconciliation between the Eastern Orthodox and the Oriental Orthodox? And then um, as a follow-up to that, what would you say are the necessary steps for reconciliation with Roman Catholicism? I think something for both the uh, Roman Catholic Church and for Eastern Orthodoxy, uh, a huge step that we would greatly appreciate is the lifting of the anathemas on St. Severus and St. Dioscorus. I think that would be huge. Um, I think for Eastern Orthodoxy, uh, it might be the biggest thing because after that, then we would just somehow be able to uh, reconcile which line of patriarch to continue on and then that would be it because there's no real we don't when we sit at the table there's no theological thing i think the eastern orthodox side is telling us you have to accept chalcedon and we're telling them you have to lift the anathemas of our saints and that's pretty much it with the roman catholic church that would be the first step then the next step would be the dogmas that we don't share so it would be for example the universal uh, ordinary jurisdiction of the bishop of rome uh, that would probably be the biggest one uh, because I know for us, the bishop, we believe in the high patrine um, ecclesiology, so not the Pentarch, because that was at Chalcedon, which we don't accept. So I believe that Peter established, Peter, had, Peter is the chief of the apostles, wherever he is. He was in Antioch, he sent Mark to Alexandria, and he was in Rome. So these are the patrine sees. Uh, but uh, this is not something for us that is like a as it, simultaneously we're okay with what Constant, Constantinople's claim. It's not a thing at, uh, that's not preventing unity between us. But with Rome, uh, it's the ordinary jurisdiction of the Bishop of Rome in, for example, Alexandria's jurisdiction or in Antioch's jurisdiction to come in and to be able to change whatever he wants the liturgy, the right, etc. Okay, so you're essentially saying you agree with um, the Petrine view, but you're making the distinction that all three C's, Antioch, Rome, and Alexandria, have equal status uh, because all are directly or indirectly established by Peter, you know, via Mark or Peter himself. Yeah. So you would take issue with some of the early fathers who made a distinction, however, even within that category, those who would say, um, you know, even though all three were founded by Peter, um, the primacy would still exist among them with Rome. You would you would take issue with those things. So no, you wouldn't necessarily no. see a higher status with Rome or we, we do. We, we would see Rome as first among equals. Okay. Uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, and just uh, like I said, it's the the powers of the Bishop of Rome. Mm -hmm. We wouldn't want to be, he, we wouldn't want to infringe on our jurisdiction. Right, more of a matter of jurisdiction. So, I mean, what, what does that primacy entail? Um, you know, if it's excluding jurisdiction, what exactly does that mean? Um, you know, first among equals, is it pretty much equivalent to what some Eastern Orthodox would posit? Be because there's differences there among Eastern Orthodox as well. Yeah, I think it would be, we would have to find examples of in the early church, for example, when people would appeal to Rome if there was a heresy. Or, um, and even in that case, Rome might not even be right 100% of the time. Or in, let's, like when uh, Paul of Samosata was, deposed in the third century by the Synod of Antioch. The Church of Antioch then wrote letters to Alexandria and to Rome telling them what happened and who the, the new patriarch is, and then both of those sees just signed off on it. Um, I'm not sure if that that plate of the Bishop of Rome would have 
a power in terms of something, um, some sort of divine, uh, what's the word? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, so you, you would you would say that his role and his position isn't necessarily divinely established. Is it more just kind of a, a political, historical happenstance? A, a, a position of honor he would have as first among equals. Just like right okay. now, current situation for Oriental Orthodoxy, the Pope of Alexandria, he is first among equals. Um, mm -hmm. He cannot involve in the Syriac Orthodox Church. That's not his jurisdiction. Um, and when they are together, even when the Patriarch of Antioch and the Pope of Alexandria are together, no one sits in the patriarchal throne, even whoever's visiting the other one. They sit in equal chairs, hmm. for example. Okay, Craig, what are your thoughts about all this, especially when he, um, the subdeacon speaks about the reconciliation between Eastern Orthodoxy and the terms that he mentioned? Would you agree with those? Um. I would definitely love um, for our comedians to rant, to be able to be one again. Um, and quite frankly, the conditions are very minor. If you really think about it, go, we'll accept your councils. We reinterpret your later councils as authentic witnesses to your tradition. We see ourselves as brothers with you. What more could you want? And then I think though, there's this issue which may not be so personal to me or even to the subdeacon, but how, what are we to do with our different saints? And when our different saints hated each other, how do we accept them? And I think it would take a miracle and I'm not, but not like you say that it's an expression to say it can't happen. As in meaning, if these men are saints, if miracles started happening because of these men's prayers, or something to validate their that the, that they should be venerated. If that was clear about our saints to the Oriental Orthodox and their saints to us, then I do think that's the main thing, um, because then that would show that there there is something here. Um, because it's not that there hasn't been in the past, um, you know, for para temporary periods of time, parallel churches, and then one of those guys becomes a saint like they're in the Malaysian schism, um, and there are two peoples on two different sides and they become saints anyway. Um, what makes them saints, it's not always they made every correct decision in, in, in life, but the holiness of who they were as people and that their intercessions in heaven um, are something that are apparent in earth, and so we canonize them because obviously there's more saints than there are canonized saints. They're just the hall of famers, so to say. Um, so I, I would say that would just have to be clearer. And I think in the past, if I could say this in an upbeat note, there's no internet. So there'd be no way of knowing the miracles happening in Egypt. Um, then maybe that could break down now with increased transportation and, uh, and the flatter earth and, and somewhat friendlier, um, administrations like in, in Syria and Egypt, um, which just are all aren't great, especially in Egypt, but it's not that, um, let's say Eastern Orthodox can't visit Egypt or something like that. So it doesn't seem like it's going to happen yet, but maybe something like even in the United States where you got these kind of neutral grounds where we're both, we're the closest thing to one another. And it's very common where the Eastern Orthodox are in a town and the only, the only church in town is the Oriental Orthodox. It's not a common, they convert the Oriental Orthodox and vice versa. And so I think we need the validation of their saints and they need the validation of ours. I'm not the saints and I'm not God, so I don't know how that's going to happen. Mm. Uh, but I think that so, we do you think that, oh, I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to cut you off. The audio was cutting out on me. No, no, that's, that, that was my point. Well, do, would you say that it is possible to lift the anathemas? Is there historical precedent for, um, the lifting of anathemas that happens in an ecumenical council? I don't think so. I don't think so. However, there's some debate, let's say like the fifth ecumenical council on legitimate manuscript grounds that origin, for example, was never anathematized. Um, so there could be discernment where an honest observer, not you know, a happy dippy liberal saying, Oh, kumbaya, this is look past everything, where we could say, Okay, these anathemas were added after this council, or or even 
we don't receive every canon of a council as infallible. Um, so then are we, is this a faith morals thing? And it's, like I said, it pertains to, as I said before, a reception in the church. When we look at these councils as mechanical and everything that happens, this then can't be changed. It almost makes the cat, the councils themselves inconsistent with one another. And that, and that goes even before Chalcedon, quite frankly. Um, because, for example, Constantinople one, and I think uh, the subdeacon maybe can answer is I think is now accepted um, by the Oriental Orthodox, though not necessarily um, obviously the canon that elevates Constantinople. But they would they would recognize the, uh, the Constantinopolitan Creed and whatnot. So, and we see that in Chalcedon that they would even not recite that creed, the Egyptians particularly, for that reason, because then with that would come you accepted this canon, which they could not accept for obvious reasons. Mm -hmm. um, so I do think it would take a miracle, um, but it would be less theological if they're saying, yep, we accept the fifth council. We think Halston could be generally interpreted. And I would give the, I would give the compliment to the Oriental Orthodox that I think they're by far willing to make the most honest concessions as in, staying true to their theological tradition, but really reaching out um, than any of our communions. While let's say those concessions made by Roman Catholicism, I mean, are almost equal to what he's making to non-Christians. <laughs> so it's not too different there. Um, and the Eastern Orthodox are notorious for pretty much not making concessions whatsoever. So that, that's how I would, I would at least view the situation, my humble opinion. Okay. Now, Subdeacon, I want to ask you, what is your view on icons, the Oriental Orthodox understanding of them? Because I, I know you wouldn't presumably accept a Seventh Ecumenical Council, yet I see you have some icons in the background, and I, I've noticed that Oriental Orthodox use them. Do you all have a different understanding of iconography? And um, if if not, what, what exactly is your view? That's a great question. So we, we view the Ecumenical Councils, even the ones we accept, just to be affirmations of what we already believe, always. So even if there was, even if we haven't accepted the Seventh Ecumenical Council, we have always believed in icons. So, uh, but the difference is then in the rite you're talking about. So in, the, let's say, the Coptic rite, for example, it's mm -hmm. part of the theology. I, I, I can, it's just like how in the Eastern Orthodox Church, where you have to have an iconostasis and all of this. In the Syriac rite, including the Indian church, it's not part of the theology of the church. It's encouraged art in the church that we have, but the, there's no iconostasis. We have the curtain because it's the, the Middle Eastern Semitic version of Christianity. Uh, so it's very, um, I guess, old school for lack of a better term. Uh, with the curtain and this type of thing, it's not part of, it's essential to the architecture of the church. Okay, but you would agree with the theology behind the duly alatria distinction and the vener veneration of images? Sure. Okay. Sure. Yeah. All right. And, you know, for that matter, what would you say about the Sixth ec Ecumenical Council with monothelitism? Would you uh, agree with where the church, uh, the Eastern Orthodox Church, landed on that topic? So, uh, we disagree with monothelitism, and the reason is because you're saying that Christ is in two natures, yet he has one will. I, I, not you that you guys say that, the, the, her, the heretics at that time. So, mm -hmm. um, so if, he ha if he is from two natures, like we say, and he has one nature, and so he, it's one will from two wills. Mm -hmm. that it's matching. It's not he is in two natures, yet he has one will. That's confusing for everybody. It doesn't work on either side. Okay. And when you say he's from two natures, you would still say that those two natures um, remain intact and are not confused um, in the incarnation? It's just the inability of the, of us to be able to make a distinction. So mm -hmm. Severus gives an example. The one who walked on the water, it is foreign for the divinity to have feet, but the human can't walk on water. So which one was it? It's the one incarnate word. So, I mean, so the actual Chalcedonian definition, um, mm -hmm. you you would be able to say that you can accept it properly understood. 
Yes, because we are looking at it from the fifth ecumenical council's interpretation. Mm -hmm. yeah. Gotcha. Craig, um, what are your thoughts there, especially about the, the um, understanding there of icons? Um, in some in some ways, like with the curtain, that was the earliest practice that I'm aware of, like because uh, St. Epiphanius and his writing against icons speaks of a curtain with icons on it. So it's um, whether you have an iconostasis or something, whatever you're using to separate the altar from the rest of the church is what's appropriate. Um, you know, and it's not coincidental that the Indians and the Ethiopians, they were all using these curtains without really this cultural contact necessarily, even with uh, Christians in the Middle East or Christians in Egypt so much at, at a certain point. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think that I think that's fine. I don't think we really have differences. I think there's cultural differences. Um, it, it, particularly Egyptians seem to have assimilated a lot of Roman Catholic um, iconography and in statuary and things to that effect, which are not as popular in Eastern Orthodoxy. Um, but again, I don't see any Eastern Orthodox site that as an as a actual point of difference. I, if you affirm that the icons are windows to heaven, they convey theological realities that when the venerated, your that honor passes on to the person you're venerating who's actually in heaven. Um, I don't see I don't see any real difference there. Okay. Well, you know, so Deacon, you were talking about ecumenical councils, and you were saying that you might agree with the theology behind it, even though you might not necessarily accept them as part of the ecumenical councils. So, how do Oriental Orthodox determine what is an ecumenical council versus um, an illegitimate council or a local council. Um, how, how exactly do I identify it? Does it have to be that all, all six churches agree with each other? Or what is your understanding? So uh, let's use like Ephesus 2, for example, which uh, is not an ecumenical council with, in either side. But uh, Ephesus 2 was commissioned by the Roman emperor and uh, Pope Dioscorus of Alexandria was the legate for uh, Pope Leo at the time to do this. Um, is when he didn't read the tome, when he didn't allow the tome to be read, uh, at that point, Rome rejected this and called it uh, the Robertson. So it became now not an ecumenical council in the eyes of the imperial church or the, the Roman church. Um, so I don't know if there is a clear way of being able to uh, know when it's happening. So like he, uh, like Craig mentioned about Constantinople 381, it wasn't accepted as an ecumenical council by the Oriental Orthodox until um, I think the late fifth century, which is a hundred years later. Uh, so there's no, I don't know if there's one and one clear way to always know when a council happens, if it's ecumenical or not. It just, it or, it's organically kind of accepted that way over time or it's not. Craig, I'm, I'm pretty sure you would agree with that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we, we've discussed ecumenical councils before, and it, it sounds like uh, you were describing the reception view, but uh, it has to be received among your clergy. So I guess we, we have to then take it a step back and then determine how do you identify who, you know, is, you know, in apostolic succession correctly. Is it you're just saying that the bishop who has apostolic succession and has the right theology is the the correct bishop. Is that essentially right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's it. Uh, I think St. Ignatius also, he says, uh, wherever the bishop is, wherever the Eucharist is, there's the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, of course, you have um, bishops without apostolic succession with a valid Eucharist who would come, you know, with different doctrines and different views. So at that point, it, it seems like you have to already determine what the church believes in order to identify who is the orthodox and correct bishop. Is, is that fair? Right. I think Ignatius, uh, it, it, obviously in Ignatius' time, this didn't, he didn't deal with our problem that we have now, but uh, I think then it's on, and unfortunately, it's on us to kind of find where that orthodoxy continued in which communion. It's, it's unfortunate, but we have options. 
Okay. Well, there was something that I was reading quite a while back, and I'd like to know more about it. Within Oriental Orthodoxy, it seems that there was some kind of controversy surrounding Pope Shenouda, if, if I'm not mistaken, and some other bishops. Um, it seems like there was perhaps a kind of a liberal bent among some of the clergy in Oriental Orthodoxy, and there was a controversy there. Um, is that accurate? Is there some kind of liberal struggle going on that you might, you know, lo you know that you might actually say you know, Catholicism? From my understanding, uh, and again, I'm Syriac Orthodox, so I'm outside of the, I'm not, we're in communion with the Coptic Church, but I'm not that close to their politics. Um, so I actually understood the situation the opposite. Uh, pope Toadros, who is the current pope, he is very conservative. Uh, but I think the followers of Pope Shenouda are extremists. And um, that had caused some problems within the Coptic Church. Things like rebaptizing Catholics or. Uh, so it was, other, it was actually among the Coptics, not the Oriental Orthodox, that the, yeah. the controversy. Okay, so I, I was just misunderstanding the circumstances. It's been a while since I've read about it. Um, yeah. But would you say that you're, you're still seeing some of those difficulties that you see? For example, with Roman Catholicism, there's definitely a liberal uh, struggle going on there. And you can find it somewhat in Eastern Orthodoxy. Is that happening in Oriental Orthodoxy as well? It's happening, but there is a strong pushback from my generation, from our generation, uh, we are we're conservative, we're traditional, and we don't want that. Um, so, for example, you will find sometimes they'll have musical instruments, something, some some annoying thing that they will do, and uh, we're trying our best to make sure that that, that stuff doesn't infiltrate us. Looks like. Uh, yeah, sorry about that. I think you're cutting out on me there for a second. Craig, Craig um, did you have any thoughts about this um, topic as far as maybe some liberalism that exists among the Oriental Orthodox? Or is that not really something you've looked into? I'm not really too aware of it. All I could say is that um, it does, I think, due to persecution, that um, Arab Christians, and this would be a, across my uh, Oriental and Eastern Orthodox lines are, seem to be less scrupulous with a lot of things. And, um, and I think it's because, you know, when you're staring death in the face all the time, you, you don't, a lot of these issues, which we could in our comfort debate about seem unimportant. Um, so you particularly see in Egypt, uh, you know, liberalization with even the music they'll have in church. You'll, you could watch like, you know, bishops, doing this with their arms and singing and there's musical instruments and stuff like that. And so you, and they have a charismatic movement within, and it's not people speaking in tongues, but exorcisms and, you know, pretty out there sort of stuff and people really getting excited. And so I think it does speak to, um, in some sense, the Egyptian church has culturally been able to adapt um, to um foreign influences while retaining an Egyptian character, I think more successfully than all the other churches would seem they have to betray their identity in some way to do these things. It's like they're able to put it on the side and, and take it away when they need to. But there's definitely, you because you could see it. Uh, you could see, like I said, the Roman Catholic stature. You could see it in the music and stuff. I would say the main thing, and this is where um, – I would be interested in Deacon's take is I've read that at least among the Egyptians, they've stopped their prayers for those in hell. And that would be in some sense a liberalization because the fact they were doing them in the past and obviously Eastern Orthodox still have prayers for those that are in hell and Eastern Catholics still have prayers for those who are in hell. Does, uh, that does betray like a sort of more modern look at it that, well, if someone, someone's in hell, they can't get out. And, um, you know, there's no repentance after death, like it says in Second Clement. And see, it seems like due to rationalization, the common practice been across all these lines across centuries has at least very recently been abandoned, at least I think officially by Eva. But maybe I'm, maybe I'm misinformed. So that'd be my comment on that. Um, Subdeacon, what do you think about that, especially in regards to the prayers uh, for those in hell? I have no knowledge of, 
us ever having prayers for people in hell. Uh, I could be wrong, but I have never uh, learned that or come across that in my studies. Um, I know even Pope Shenouda had said that we're not even supposed, or he was talking for the Coptic Church, but mm -hmm. we're not even supposed to pray for those who commit suicide. So, uh, like I think, and we use for the First John five sixteen seventeen, the sin uh, leading to death that we shouldn't pray for the person is the meaning the one who denies Christ and is now in hell apostasy or leaves his religion. Don't pray for him. So uh, that's again, I could be wrong. Maybe you've, you've seen something I haven't seen. I, I'm just not aware of us having that in our tradition at all. Um, I want to go to some questions um, from the chat, but first, um, Craig, I, th I think Father John Whiteford had a um, a point that he brought up here, and and we and this is actually a point that I wanted to bring up as well. So let me go ahead and identify that first, and then we'll uh, go to the subdeacon and present those questions. Um, Father John says we pray for those in Hades, not Gehenna. Big difference, and this is one of the things I've noticed within Eastern Orthodoxy. There is some controversy. There's some Eastern Orthodox that would actually say those in Hades um, can be uh, can cross over into heaven before the second judgment, the final judgment. And then others would say, no, uh, these are prayers for those in, in Hades, but not necessarily the damned. Um, what would you say in response to that? And I am going to grab my laptop charger before it turns off on me, so don't mind me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go ahead, though. I think, oh, well, for me, I, I'll, I'll respond first, and, and Subdeacon could offer a, a rejoinder. Um, obviously, Father's right, because in Orthodox doctrine, um, hell's really not until you get to, the, like, the last judgment, right? Hades has, you know, the 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 Muslim of Abraham and um, the other side where it isn't so nice. You have this foretaste of heaven or hell, but it's not like the full confirmation of the real thing. So obviously, I'm just more using popular King James English vernacular than really get into the Greek um, mm -hmm. when, I, when I'm saying that. Um, but uh, point taken. Um, that being said, yeah, that would be it is interesting whether or not the um, what the subdeacon here, his understanding would be if you have a relative that did not die in some overt mortal sin, you know, mm -hmm. you know where do they think they are, and then why do they pray for them if they're not in here? Yeah, from, from what I've seen when I've looked at the prayers, the liturgical prayers in the Eastern Orthodox Church, it's it's unclear exactly um, who the prayer is for. It's definitely for those, those in Hades, but it's not clear that these are people um, it, who uh, have mortal sin, who are actually damned in Hades. It, it seems like it could, um, could include those, but could also just be those... Um, who, for example, would have been in you know Abraham's bosom, and well, be if I could just respond that real quick, and this would probably be a, a good video. Um, mm -hmm. While the the Greek Orthodox Church um, in America has a statement pretty much against it, it's mm -hmm. really hard to square with some some stories from the lives of the saints where they say, "I had a relative, I had a vision, and she was in hell, and I prayed, and she got out of hell." Or I hate it. So right. Point. You know, this person is being tortured. There's obviously the story of Gregory the Great praying Trajan out of Hades. And, you know, and, and Trajan was not in the nice part. <laughs> I think one of our earliest right. documents in Christian history is Trajan getting, you know, writing a letter about how to, you know, how we find who Christians are so we could torture them. So, um, you know, it's, it is something, if we were to say, well, maybe the people we're praying for in Haiti really aren't in the bad part, I think is inconsistent with, I mean, the whole point is that hope that, you know, someone with even the little shred of repentance, that, that, that little ember could be blown to a flame for God. And so that's usually how it's explained. And um, the stories and spiritual lives of saints seems to accord with that. Yeah, and you can find, I don't exactly know how to pronounce his name, but Dimitru Staniloe, I guess is how you would pronounce him. You see his orthodox dogmatic 
uh, book out there pretty often, but I believe it's in volume one where he actually explicitly says, you know, between the first judgment and the second judgment, it's possible to pray for those who are, have mortal sin, but very little mortal sin who are currently damned. It's possible for them through the prayers of the church to transition over. So you'll see some hold to that and then others others don't, but we could probably uh, do a show on it. Um, I want to ask Subdeacon, um, there, there are a couple questions for you. Um, first, it's a two-part question. It's from Elijah. He asks, um, who is your favorite early church father? And then I, I want to say this is probably t tongue in cheek. Um, how often do you pray to Pope Leo the Great? Um, <laughs> and, then, and, then, and then there's another one that's tongue in cheek uh, by Jobin, who asks, why is the subdeacon, um, subdeacon Daniel so cool? So evidently you've left an impression on, on some people. <laughs> but yeah, who would you say is your favorite early church father? Say Ephraim. Say Ephraim, uh, easy. Uh, I love Saint Severus. He's probably my favorite in terms of Christology. But mm -hmm. Saint Ephraim uh, in everything. He, and just real quick regarding what you, what you guys were just talking about, uh, he says, um, perhaps, perhaps there are those outside of the gates of paradise um, waiting for our prayers and for the mercy of God so that they can finally go inside. So we have this type of thing, but. I don't think we have anything very clear or explicit. Yeah, there's definitely not anything very clear. Um, there's a few patristic quotes, um, but it's very, very, um, you know, you, you do have to read a little bit into them. It's not very clear whether they're referring to people um, who are actually damned. Um, although they're all, <laughs> It was explicit. Yeah, I, I want to say there's a one by Pope Gregory the Great, um, but I, I'm not sure if it's actually authentic or not, but it at least is attributed to him. But yeah, he, you know, what the um, Orthodox theologian here is saying is that, you know, only between the first and second judgment, you know, the, the individual judgment when you die and the final judgment of, um, you know, when Christ returns, there is a possibility of transition for those at the very top of the damned. But after the second judgment, there's absolutely um, no change there. It's absolutely immutable at that point where you are is just where you are. So it, it might make for an interesting, interesting show. Um, but we are pretty, pretty uh, close to an hour here. So let me just go ahead and ask you, did you have any concluding thoughts or anything that you would like for the uh, viewers to consider about Oriental Orthodoxy? Um, and this is, of course, for you, Subdeacon. Oh, thank you. Uh, so first, thank you again for, for bringing me on. And um, I'm just happy that I'm getting to share Oriental Orthodoxy to whoever's listening. I know that we don't have a lot out there. And uh, most people don't even know about us that we even exist. Um, People confuse us for other religions all the time. No one even knows that we're. I was talking to these Catholics, and they're like, "So you guys pray five times a day and don't eat pork." And, and anyways, so, <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, uh, so yeah, thank you for this. And I'm as long as people we're just aware of each other because I think in future generations, and I think that we have the same struggle against modernism, against liberalism. So we're all, uh, and future generations are going to be closer to each other, whether they are Roman Catholic, Eastern Orthodox, Oriental Orthodox. And through this, um, then we will start being on the same page. And like uh, Craig said, it's going to take a miracle, which we believe in, but then hopefully we will become one again. Absolutely, Lord willing. Um, Craig, did you have any concluding thoughts? I'll just say that, you know, we, um, the, or the Eastern Orthodox and the, and the Nestorians share, you know, St. Isaac the Syrian. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so, and it speaks to, and when Eastern Orthodox try to explain this, like, well, but his Christology was not Nestorian, but then the question is, well, was he actually in communion with the Eastern Orthodox Church? And so I, I see at least, the, and, and one other example would be, Jan Hus and Drama Pro, uh, Prague are venerated in the Orthodox Church and in the Czech lands, and allegedly even they in Greece. I wasn't aware. Of that. So, so it's 
Well, that's what the uh, defract metropolitan of that <laughs> jurisdiction has said. <laughs> and, uh, well, maybe he stepped down. I can't remember. But you get the point. So, but being that we have this hope that, yes, we can even venerate saints that are outside our communion, but we're otherwise orthodox. It, does, it leaves open, like I said, if that miracle validates that our saints and their saints are all saints, then um, we have, I think, the most solid ground for uh, re-entering communion. Um, but that's, a, I say, a big hurdle, and we argue all this theology, but in, in reality, I think I think uh, somebody can hit the nail on that. That really, it's about venerate my saints. And we're like, no, you venerate our saints. And, and I think that's really the real debate. Yeah. All right. Well, Craig, uh, Subdeacon Daniel, thank you both for coming on. I really appreciate you doing this. And hopefully we'll get to do it again sometime. Absolutely. Thank you. Viewers, please like, comment, subscribe. And until next time, go share your faith. Thank you.